Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we are covering Sweetbridge, which is a project that is seeking to create a stable coin and enable participants in the Ethereum ecosystem to have more liquidity for the assets they might uh, they might possess. On our show is Bob Somerville, who's been uh, an old member of the Ethereum community, has worked in the Ethereum Foundation, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and now Sweetbridge. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. You've been in the IT industry for a long time, and then you transitioned into blockchains with Ethereum. Tell us, tell us how you made this transition into blockchain technology and what attracted you to Ethereum in particular? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I started programming when I was 10 years old in, in 1984, back in the, uh, the 8-bit days. Uh, my, my father was a self-taught uh, developer who built a, uh, a library uh, and, and sort of shop system for stock taking of a, uh, a library at the university he worked he was he'd, he'd bring his computer home in the evenings to, to work on that and you know, a curious child well you know what are you doing dad what what's what's this about and uh you know, so i got got hooked quite early there um and i uh, i ended up studying computer science at the university of leeds uh, computer science and ai um and was lucky enough to meet somebody on my course who was working in the games industry. So I, uh, my first job straight out of university was, was joining uh, uh, Cygnosis, a, a Sony subsidiary in the UK. Um, and uh, I remember at the time, it's not a real job, right? You, you can't get paid to like do games. Like, that's not a real thing. You know, always sort of thinking, well, I'll, I'll get a real job at some point. But, uh, but yeah, that, that, that was 1996, um, and I, uh, I moved to Vancouver to, uh, to work on FIFA. Uh, I, 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 I did six FIFAs, I did 20 AAA games for EA Sports uh, over those years, uh, FIFA, NBA, NHL, SSX, uh, worked in central technology, um, build systems, uh, configuration management. Uh, uh, automation testing, um, uh, lots and lots of collaboration projects. Um, because EA has got about 10,000 employees, you know, 20 or so studios around the world. Um, so you, you, you do get lots of these, uh, you know, they're quite decentralized in a way. You know, lots of, uh, lots of, of companies which were independent that were acquired. So you have, you know, you have different cultures in, 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 in different uh, in different studios, different teams. Um, so working on on those collaboration projects, I think, will really set me up quite well um, for for coming into blockchain. So I, I, I left EA in in two thousand and fourteen, um, really sort of uh, feeling the need to do my own things. You know, feeling trapped in a in a large hierarchy that uh, that acted as though they owned me. They owned my brain and my thoughts. Um, you know, real inability to work on open source projects, to work on uh, on side projects. Uh, that's really what led me out uh, first into uh, into mobile um, and and wearables. Um, but then I in in, in twenty fourteen uh, I, I made a new friend, a guy called David Lowy, who'd been uh, into blockchain from very very early. Um, Said his, his first Bitcoin purchases were at five cents. He uh, he he used to own Bitcoin.com many years ago. He flipped that wow. and did quite well. And uh, he he uh, he took me along to to decontrol to the uh, the um, sort of co-working space and uh, and, and meet up uh, place here. And uh, you know, that, that was sort of uh, Bitcoin two point era. You know, sort of ripple just sort of appearing. You know, talking about pegging and side chains and you know, dreams of all of the things that could be done on top of blockchain. 
uh, but you know none of it was a reality at that point. The uh, the the Ethereum white paper had just been released, but I mean this was probably January February 2014. So you know not not again just sort of talk at that stage. Uh, but later that year, uh, Vitalik was actually uh, in Vancouver coming through, uh, spending a day with David. Um, that was that was prior to the foundation launching, still even or, or, or the crowd sale. Um, so yeah, I, I got to meet Vitalik in sort of uh, I think it was July 2014. I, I I posted to my Facebook page that day. You know, I I have met a genius. Nobody, none of you will have heard of this guy, but he is going to be world famous <laughs> in a few years. And uh, you know, really just saw saw an awful lot of potential there though i remember saying to him at the time so it's so it's like a single threaded computer for the whole world like how, how's that going to scale <laughs> you know in, in an era of, of of you know cloud computing and giant resources you, you've got something that's sort of like a you know an old pc of the 80s and uh you know, like well you know i've got ideas on sharding and uh proof of stake but just sort of uh, I, I, I had my own focus at that time, and it's like, no, keep, I'll, I'll keep my eye on you, but, you know, good, good luck, young man. Um, but then in 2015, I, I found myself in uh, in Toronto uh, working in my first real suit and tie job. Uh, I joined uh, TD Securities to to help them with, with agile DevOps and, and cloud adoption. Um, and I took the opportunity to go to meetups there, went along to Decentral. Met Jeff uh, Coleman, who was doing techno crypto. Um, you know, met up with Anthony Diorio, went to Deck Tech at Mars, um, and uh, uh, Paul Pashos's um, Ethereum meetup there. And you know, it, it was just very evident to me. You know, they've done it. You know, <laughs> we're about to launch Mainnet, and and this thing is for real. And and I could not not get involved. You know, prior to, to to learning about blockchain, I think like many others, you know, had a, a real sort of journey of well, you know, what's happening with this financial crisis, and how does money work, and the elites, and you know, what what on earth is is happening to the world? You know, are we powerless pawns? And I really, you know, for, for me, blockchain was you know this real opportunity. Well, wow, we can you know we can pull the controls back round to our side of it, and you know, I'm a developer, I can help. You know, I can actually. You know, I can actually do a positive, proactive thing to try and uh, move things towards this this new paradigm. Um, so that's what I did. I mean, I, I you know, I guess the analogy in my head was, um, you know, if you had met Linus Torvalds and he said, you know, I'm doing this this Linux thing, you know, it's just for fun. You know, hey Bob, you, you know C, you know C plus plus. Can you help a bit? You know, w- would that have been a good thing to do? Would that have been fun? Whether or not it worked out. Um, so that's what I did with uh, with Ethereum. Is I just got involved, um, you know, really with the thought that you know maybe that can turn into some job later. Maybe that will be some paid work. Maybe I can find something at some startup doing something. Um, but instead, it turned into you know sort of ushered into the inner sanctum um, because in late 2015, when the foundation was you know nearly running out of money and. Uh, Gavin, the C plus plus team, kind of moved out and, and formed Parity. Um, the the project that I set myself as a starter, which was actually seeing can I get Ethereum running on a smartwatch. Um, I was building on top of that code base, and the team went away. Um, so I went in and helped, and and I was the only person in the world that did. So then I got hired, and off we went. At some level sort of demonstrates the power of following what you think is cool and scratch your own itch right yeah because like i think this seems to have happened twice in your career like you scratched your itch with gaming early on without a financial model per se of and then you did it with ethereum and both have worked out quite well for you yeah, and I mean, I, 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 I really hope that, you know, when we are more in a, a, you know, the new network paradigm, that more people get the opportunity to do that. Because I think that just both fear 
and and just financial constraints just stop so many people from doing things that they love that they really care about right so many people just get stuck in a well you know that's a good enough you know if if i do that job you know it won't drive me completely insane and i can have fun on you know in my spare time but you know basically end up doing 30 40 years of stuff that they don't really care about that much yeah and then you switched to consensus and worked with the enterprise ethereum alliance right what were you doing there well i mean that that story actually started a little earlier which was um when i had joined the foundation really you know working on that c++ client and, and really helping to sort of reboot that team you know after the departure of the uh, original development team um the other thing that popped up in that period was was hyperledger so i was going to the o'reilly oscon conference in may 2016 i you know i just wanted to go to the conference and um and just before that you know hyperledger had been announced and i mean my first reaction was oh my god it's like your dad's turned up at the at the dance club you know you you down the disco <laughs> and your your dad's come oh my god this is so embarrassing you know like you know, they're trying to play it being cool. This is going to be so terrible. You know, like, what's enterprise blockchain going to be? Like, it's, oh, my God. Anyway, that, that I see in respect, in, in, in retrospect, that, that was over cynical. You know, there are a lot of, uh, of fantastically talented people um, in, 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 these, uh, in these enterprises as well. But, but heading into that, um, I, I spotted that consensus were part of... Um, of Hyperledger. And I was like, well, what's going on there? I, you know, I thought consensus were totally uh, Ethereum. You know, what, why, are, why, are they in why are they in this? And what is Hyperledger anyway? You know, you've got, you've got IBM, you've got Intel, uh, you know, you've got digital assets holdings, you know, and it's like everyone's sort of throwing their, throwing their tech in a heap and like, are they trying to pick a winner or like, what, like, what is this thing? What, what's going on? So I started lurking on the Slack and you know, trying to trying to see what was going on there, and then ended up talking to uh, um, to Joseph Chow, and then Andrew Keys, and then and then Joe Lubin about you know, well, what 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 do you think is going on with Hyperledger? What what what's what does consensus want of this? Um, and and that was really quite simple. Was was well, we we want to get an Ethereum code base in there. You know, we we we, we think that you know Ethereum is 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 a is a great technology for enterprise. Uh, you know that the consensus had had their large uh, consulting, you know, consensus enterprise arm for a good amount of time, and it was and it was getting real traction. And you know they rightly thought that Ethereum should be part of that. Um, but the real barriers to that were were licensing, were finding uh, an Apache two permissively licensed code base that could go in. Um, and I said, well. I, I think CPP Ethereum is is, is MIT licensed, um, uh, and it turned out not quite to be true. There had been an earlier effort at relicensing, um, uh, but I picked that up again. Um, you know, I'd, I'd uh, when I when I did go down to OzCon, I set up a um, uh, an open source blockchain uh, meetup, invited all the the Bitcoin meetup, the Ethereum meetup, the blockchain for business meetup, people from the IBM uh, lab there. You know, from Tendermint, from Factum, uh, from the conference, and and had a really a, a really great kind of meeting. I, I later did a a blog post called uh, "Cats and Dogs Can Be Friends," and I got to meet Brian Bellendorf there as well, who was announced as the executive director at OzCon the following morning. Um, and 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 yeah, really, I, I started a great friendship with with Brian and with uh, Chris Ferris. Uh, you know, who's the fabric. Uh, lead at that point really really looking to see if we could bridge those communities so i i was working towards relicensing of that cpp uh, ethereum client to see could we get to this wonderful place of saying okay you're you're concerned with public ethereum great talk to the ethereum foundation if you want to do enterprise stuff fantastic talk to our partners at the linux foundation you know who've done hundreds and hundreds of these collaboration projects uh, and they can help you um, that 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 relicensing effort failed. That that was not approved by uh, uh, by by parity by uh, by Gavin Wood. 
um, I talked a, a fair bit about that. We're, we're reconciled and happy now, but it was it was a real kind of blow to me at the time. And and really, that's where the EA came from was uh, the failure of that that initial bridging effort, um, and really that uh, that Joe offered me, you know, sort of a, a second bite at that cherry of saying, well. You know the the grand union failed, uh, but we have enough enterprise Ethereum people that we can get together our own consortium and maybe we can move quicker because we're all on the same tech base. But really, the aim just saying, well, what does it take to get to production ready? You know, from where we are with public Ethereum, what what does it take to get to you know a product that you can stand up in the market? You know, against uh, border, against uh, you know the IBM blockchain offering and saying, you know, here's a uh, you know enterprise grade ready to go um their clients so uh uh yeah I, I worked on that for for a year between october 2016 and uh and october 2017 that launching in in february of 2017 um, i was the the vice chair of the technical steering committee the aim there just getting together enterprises and startups and, and saying well hey what what can we build what do you need uh well how do you get to how do you get to done? That's a fasc fascinating story on how 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 you came to your your current role uh, with Streetbridge and and I, I agree. I mean, I I, I think that for Ethereum to succeed over the long term, uh, it does need um, you know it it does need to have a solid public network, but it also needs to have a product that can can be sold to 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 enterprise. Uh, that uh, you know is production ready, as you said. Um, so moving on to to Sweetbridge, you know perhaps a, a, a good way to start is is to to quote um, the CEO of Sweetbridge. I was I was watching talks earlier. So what, one of the great things about Sweetbridge is um, you guys publish these talks uh, on YouTube. There's a few out. We'll, we'll link to them in the show notes. But in um, so Scott Nelson. Um, said that that C, that uh, Sweetbridge is a series of protocols over multiple years that will bring liquidity in all forms to capital assets and talents within supply chains. So, could could you help us unpack that statement? Uh, what is it that he means here? I mean, the the, the reason I moved to Sweetbridge was not unhappiness at consensus in EA, but really seeing a, you know a, a a bigger and a more impactful mission which was really making you know the the promise of blockchain technology for 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 social impact and change on the world you know come come to reality you know i i ended up at, at sweetbridge on the recommendation of, of vinay gupta he actually you know referred me recommended me and when i started talking to them you know i i really realized well you know again i can't not do it Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping again, uh, you know, sort of into, you know, into the void a little bit. But um, but but really, you know, I, I, I am I'm compelled to act yet again, because. You know, when you look at what you have going on with with public um, blockchain, you know, even even with, you know, wherever that is now, um, you know, whatever the market cap of, of all of those are. Or three, what is it? Three, three hundred and twenty billion, something like that. Um, you know that that blockchain is small compared to traditional financing, and financing is small compared to uh, supply chain, because really supply chain is it's it's two thirds of the world's economy, fifty four trillion dollars a year, touching the lives of of three billion people, because it's everything physical. You know. It, it's you know getting away from your little geeker sphere uh, on on the computers. You know that there's actually people in the world doing physical things, moving things around. I think a good way to look at it is if if it's anything that you didn't grow or produce yourself, it came from a supply chain. So like unless you're picking your tomatoes from your garden and you're carving out your own furniture from trees that grow in your backyard. If it's if if it's a product that you own or consume, it's coming from a supply chain, and that's that's essentially everything right. in our lives, right? That, well, yeah. Well, it's civilization. I guess you know we used to live in huts, and you you would do all your stuff and cut your own wood and uh, you know grow your own food and so on. But you know we're we're, we're 
way past that. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is that most people are, are utterly, utterly dependent on other people for, for nearly all of the uh, goods and services that, that make up their lives. And, and, and that's, that interrelationship is a good thing. You know, that allows you to, uh, to specialize and, and to have, you know, vast, vast economies. Um, but, but yeah, the, you know, supply chains are, are probably an area that's, that's benefited the least from technical innovation. You know, they, they really are, you know, here's your, here's your clipboard with your paper things and filling in your, your, your stuff and so on. Um, but though, though, I mean, you, you say supply chain, but you could really say commerce or business, really. It's, 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 it's almost that broad, you know, physical business, you know, anything which is not purely digital. Um, and I mean, I guess you know, in our in our profession, we we get used to being so digitally native that you don't think about that stuff. But you know, most people on the planet are, are absolutely not. Um, you know, it is around around physical things and and retail and shipping and uh, uh, and so on. So you know, just, there's just really huge huge impact that you can have by applying this technology to to, to that area because it's 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 huge and so can you expand on what he means when he says that it will bring liquidity so how does sweetbridge bring liquidity into global commerce and you know perhaps explain why global commerce isn't liquid for sure yeah well um so i mean really the reason for that is that uh Unlike in your personal life where you just buy things and pay for them, uh, the majority of, of business transactions are here. I'm, I make an order. Uh, somebody, you know, supplies the, the, the goods or services for that order and then they send an invoice and then they're paid later. So there is this, this trade financing gap where, you know, that's fantastic that I have an order of, a, you know, a million tons of coffee beans from uh you know from starbucks or what have you but you've got to go and like find the money for that somewhere and then you know that 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 carries on down the chain that that uh the, the the big corporations that are at the top of the supply chain have uh incredible access to credit you know large companies can very easily you know do new bond issuings or whatever or just just lend money at, at great interest rates but as you go out and out towards the edges of these networks, and especially into developing markets, you don't have that access to credit. So, you know, the World Bank says that, um, you know, the number one barrier to world trade is systemic lack of access to, to credit. You know, that, that uh, large, you know, the assumptions that we have, I guess, as, as consumers even in the West of, well, of course I can get a credit card, of course I can get a mortgage, of course I could get a business loan. You know, maybe the terms aren't going to be what I like but you know it's going to be okay as long as my credit's sort of all right i'm, I'm, I'm going to get access to that you know that I, that I i will be able to to start a business i you know i can get you know lend some money to get my orders in and then i'll get paid later um but that's a complete block blocker to a lot of the world you know that you, people are reliant on on loan sharks to get the smallest amounts of money you know this is why uh, microfinancing has been so impactful uh, is you know we're not necessarily talking about a lot of money that that people need to to just start something. They they just you know don't have a hundred bucks or whatever to go down the warehouse to get a pallet of something. Um, so what that what um, Scott's talking about with with liquidity solution is that we we have a real fantastic um, opportunity uh, with blockchain of being able to um, take existing assets that people do have. Uh, uh, and essentially uh, locking those up, you know, tokenizing those and locking them up on chain. And then what you can do is is that you can you can borrow against those, but without needing a counterparty. That's the the key difference of of, of the proposition of, of Sweetbridge is is this this idea of being able to to lend yourself money, but secured on assets which you already have. So stepping away from that sort of ursury, well, you know, if you want access to credit, you know, you have to give me title on your house and, uh, you know, I, 
basically that, that, that people are, are taking their cut because they have access to credit, but you don't. So they basically borrow you, you know, they, sorry, they lend you either their own money or, or, or credit that they have access to and, the, and you will pay for that. Um, you know, so in the worst case, that's, that's loan sharking or payday loans and, and so on. Um, and even in, in, in what we would consider as the best cases, say, in the West of, well, great, I can have a mortgage and I can buy a house. Isn't that brilliant? Well, not really, because they take hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of interest uh, away from you. And I mean, it's over a long term, so you don't notice it so much. But, you know, that's, uh, that's how the financial world has become, is, uh, is, is really, you know, certain institutions or individuals have, uh, easy access to credit, uh, and they they lend that out, and they just accumulate all the money. So, uh, can you explain how one can lend himself or herself money? Like, how walk us through how? So, let's for instance say I have like maybe the simplest example: I have land, and I want to borrow money against that land. Um, Walk us through how this works, because there's there's something that that I'm I'm not clear here. Like who's rent, who's lending the money, yeah, uh, and what interest you know would, and who's benefiting from this? So I mean, uh, essentially, who's lending it is is nobody is lending it. Um, you are minting it, and I mean that's how fiat works. Is is uh you know a central bank, uh or or the commercial banks you know, through the rights that they have through the central bank, well, you know, they create new money. That's, that's how, how lending works is, is money is magicked out of, out of thin air uh, and is lent to you at interest. Uh, but what's been different is that's been an ability which, which only, you know, sovereign nations have, have been able to do. Uh, but with, with blockchain, anyone can mint tokens, anyone can mint new, new currency. Um, so that's how it works with Sweetbridge is that you, you have a real asset behind it, you know, so it isn't, it isn't funny money. Uh, you know, it's not completely made up. You know, there is a, there is a real world asset that's sitting behind it. Uh, and you're not, you're not actually, um, you know, you're not doing a fractional reserve kind of 10 times lend or, or what have you, you know, you, you have an asset, a, a real asset behind that. Uh, but you are you are minting new coins, and those are bridge coins, um, and there will be repayment terms. Um, if you don't make your repayment terms, then your 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 asset will be pulled away from you, uh, but not by a bank, but into the network. You know, it will be, it will be you know that ownership will be taken into the network, and then you know there'll be some resale mechanism. But yeah, you are essentially you are minting new coins. You there you go. You can you can exit that value to US dollars and do something with it. Uh, but you know when you you repay it, well that that closes the thing off and out of out of that uh, you, know, the, you can close the thing off. I mean you know and that's something that can that can never happen with fractional reserve. You know, fra you know sovereign debt can never be repaid, right? Uh, because it's you've got interest on top of that lending, and where, well, where's that interest coming from? Well, nowhere. It can't come from anywhere. Um, where the setup we have on sweet bridges is that those bridge coins can be, you know, closed, closed back off again, um, and the interest that that you have paid is really just it's it's just paying for, you know, the cost of uh, of that machine of, of the network being. So, essentially, like from a user experience perspective, if I have Ether, you can imagine this the sweet bridge system, the early systems that you are building is I can sort of deposit my Ether, correct. And if I if I do if I deposit a thousand dollars worth of Ether, what is it like two Ether now? So if I deposit two Ether worth a thousand dollars into the smart contract. I'm going to get uh, one thousand dollars worth of bridge coin. Uh, well, it won't be that much, no, because what you would be doing at that point is you'd be having a hundred percent loan. So, you know, you, you, uh, depending on on the asset class, there's only going to be a certain amount that you can 
lend against it. I mean, you know, it, I guess the dynamics there are very similar to margin lending. You know, you don't want to leverage yourself up too much, or if the asset value drops, you're going to get margin called and you're going to lose your money. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what ratios there are going to end up being, but yeah, the initial product will have uh, Ether and Bitcoin um, in the wallet, and you will be able to borrow against that to a certain ratio. And then the scenario really is that you you know you do have you know a, a, a sell line, and you know if you hit the the sell line, then yeah, you're going to get partially liquidated, or you can fund it up before you get close to it. I don't know if there's going to be some waiting time but yeah essentially you know you are you are having a a, a margin lend against that uh crypto asset um and don't leverage yourself up too much because it is fun it is fungible and will sell so it could be i lock i lock two ether and i get let's say 500 dollars 500 dollars worth of bridge coin out and now the, the question is what is bridge coin right like what is this yep. thing I'm getting $500 worth of? Well, you're getting something that you can exchange for US dollars that, that is essentially like a US dollar you know, stable coin, though, though not stable coin in the same synthetic way as, as uh, you know, pretty much all of the other uh, stable coins that there are, in that this is an asset backed asset. So, what you can do there is, is yeah, you could. You can exit that out of fiat, or you can keep it and hold it. So you know the other the other piece which uh, this liquidity layer is all for is really is, is for building these you know these supply chain ecosystems on top of it is is really building what's been described as a as an overlay world economy, in that uh, native cryptocurrencies are not really suitable for for trade because of both the deflationary aspect you know the hodling. Um, that they are, you know, they're not they're not designed to be used. You want to you want to hold on to them; they're valuable. Um, uh, but also just the uh, the volatility. You know, signing a contract saying, "Well, in one year, I will give you one Bitcoin for this service," is just a massive currency risk. Like, you've got no idea what that's actually going to be. You know, so it's really not suitable for signing business contracts in cryptocurrency. It's just uh, too much of a, uh, a volatility risk, but if you have something which is, you know, essentially pegged to, uh, you know, US dollar, euro, um, uh, that's that's workable. So there will be multiple bridge coins. That's the other thing to say is everything that we've been talking about so far has really been focusing on US dollar, but there will be multiple bridge coin, you know, fiat. So this, in principle, is not too different from. The thing that was attempted by BitShares, like the BitShares created the BitUSD and the BitCNY, it had exactly the same mechanism. And then later on, MakerDAO came on the scene in a big way. And they have exactly the same mechanism, except they add a certain feature on top, which is that should a lot of defaults in the system happen so it's like people came in and locked ether and got bridge coin out and if ether falls down radically right, it falls down a lot then they they have this other piece which is the mkr share uh, the shareholders would bail out the system essentially and uh, re-collateralize it so like like the liquidity part of sweet bridge appears to be Similar to BitShares, BitUSD, and similar to MakerDAO, but minus this kind of insurance system. So, so yeah, I mean, Maker are, you know, I guess a, a you know, a sister brother sibling project uh, with with Sweetbridge. Uh, uh, so Kenny, uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny Rowe um, is an advisor to, to Sweetbridge as well. Um, you know, who 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 was there at Maker uh, our chain as well. Um, I, I met with both the DAP Hub and uh, MakerDAO uh, teams in Cancun at DevCon 3. Um, the Sweetbridge tokens are built on DAP Hub code. You know, we uh, you know we don't have a formal partnership, but um, you know we kind of could. <laughs> I'd like to. 
we've just both been busy um you know because i think that you know there's a lot of similarities but yeah just a just a different economic model really um uh in that the initial building on top of ether bitcoin piece of sweetbridge it is similar to existing things but it's part of a much much broader vision um where it's really just getting the you know getting the pipes lined up with the simple case uh i mean another key advisor for sweetbridge has been a gupta in that uh his materium project the legally enforceable smart contracts is a you know a fundamental building block for you know all of the more interesting parts of sweetbridge which is really bringing off-chain uh assets uh into uh, into the pattern which is i mean that's really where you're going to get the stability is is not by trying to get to stability synthetically but by having a you know a, a broad set of real world assets which are stable you know like real estate like factoring of, of invoices you know like lending against stock um you know or, or basically anything you know really the you know the ultimate vision is is all the assets in the world uh should should come on chain and that's really how you have stability so the the idea here is okay it is easy to imagine me locking up to ether and getting 500 dollars worth of bridge coin out right like all of the primitives for um for this transaction are already built but what sweet bridge would ultimately want to enable is i don't have ether i have something that is let's say quote unquote a real world claim on something else so the example could be so by the way like i have actually worked in supply chain for most of my professional life all right uh, you're going to school me then <laughs> no 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 there's uh, there's nothing to school really like i'm pretty familiar with with this with this problem so the problem is like this so i used to work in the vaccines industry supply chain and the issue is this so the mexican government let's say the mexican government wants to buy 200000 doses of of vaccines and that 200000 doses of vaccines they're going to cost 20 million dollars we are going to ship them the vaccines and all we get from the mexican government is just a paper that says we are going to pay you 20 million dollars 60 days later that's it that's the paper we have we don't have money in the bank account um so we have all of these papers from all of all of our customers essentially but on the other side to actually manufacture the vaccine um we need to buy stuff and when we go and want to buy stuff there are some some places where you can buy stuff and you can tell them oh we will pay you 60 days later because that's when our customers will pay us but then there are other places where this this just does not work right so you have to give them money immediately whereas the money that you're going to get will come 60 days later so there's this mismatch so ultimately like what a big company like novartis needs is hey somebody take these pieces of paper from me but give me actual dollars on my bank account today so hey i'm going to receive 20 million dollars in 60 days but take this piece of paper and give me 18 million dollars today because i'll use that 18 million to buy other things and this is a very practical bread and butter problem and so the idea here what seems to me is you want to allow that kind of transaction to happen on chain right like so the simpler transaction is lock ether get bridge coin out but then the more complex transaction you want is here's novartis that locks 20 million dollars worth of this paper that somebody will pay us in 60 days they can lock that in and they they can get bridge coin out so this is ultimately what you want to enable yes yeah and i mean the so what materium is doing and and how that is fundamental is beyond assets which are already on chain there's a huge amount that we can do with with this this legal bridge mechanism uh, of saying well in in 150 jurisdictions around the world uh you two parties to an agreement 
can agree to legally binding arbitration in case of a dispute. Um, this is a thing called the New York Accords that were signed in the 1950s, really to facilitate world trade, uh, and really, I guess, came out of, of maritime law. You know, if a, if, a, if a ship goes down in the middle of the ocean in international waters, what do you do? You know, <laughs> who, who pays for it? Who, who gets what? How does that happen? And, um, and, and the answer is arbitration, you know, that that would go to some maritime lawyers who will look at what the contract was signed and will come to some determination and then that will be, um, you know, legally enforced. Um, and that mechanism uh, is, is the intended mechanism for making smart contracts uh, legally enforceable uh, through Materium is saying, well, when you sign a, a, a legal agreement between two companies or whatever, doing something, uh, you are going to sign a, uh, a real-world contract, you know, in a given jurisdiction, uh, according to their local law. Uh, you, you are going to have a, a, a real-world big-name law firm who are going to write that digital version of that for a, for a given asset class, you know, sort of as a template, you know, fill in the names and details and so on. You are going to uh, digitally sign that and hash it and anchor it, and there you go. Um, that would... Those lawyers, though, would be paired with smart contract authors who are writing the smart contract, uh, you know, really implementation of like, well, what's the flow chart? What the states this thing can go through? You know, if this and two of you signed that and then it's in this state and if it fails, it can come out. Uh, and that you're really, you know, you're digitizing uh, uh, a, a contract, uh, but you also agree to arbitration in, in case of, of dispute. And what that means is, so say that contract is, you know, is this kind of factoring, you know, agreement. Yes, we agree, we'll, we'll pay it and so on. You have something there which, which is legally enforceable. You know, in, in case of dispute there, you can take that to the arbitrators and they will take that to the to local court and the court will rubber stamp it. And no, nope, you, you own these. Yeah, oh, that, that was the house. Yeah, you... You, you tokenized your house, but yeah, that, that really was a real token. You know, someone can't say, oh, that was just silly internet money thing. You know, I'm not, I'm not leaving my home. Well, yeah, you are because you, you signed a, a, an agreement and that's legally enforceable. And I mean, like anything else, like, you know, most things never ever get to court. But the fact that you have got that, uh, you know, the, the, the force of the state at the end of the line, that gives you the confidence uh, of, of businesses to to be happy to sign a you know a, a smart contract, a, a digital signature of a of a, of a legal text, uh, and feel you know secure in doing that. So really, you, you we've we've got to the paperless office. You know, it's happened. We can actually have these things. You know, on the computers. You know, we we, we have enough of that digital infrastructure plus enough of a, a of a tie to the real world law that you can that you can do do commerce on on computers and i mean it's, it's no different really to something like you know docusign uh you know it's it's just taking the thing a step beyond uh plus using smart contracts for enforcing the actual logic so so yeah that 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 materium uh, bridge should then let you augment things which are already on chain with nearly everything which is jurisdictionally bound can can be done using that pattern. Um, a, a, a third area that we haven't got in scope, but I think we probably should at some point is 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 more like what um, Oracle eyes are doing, where you have things which are sort of like physical bearer assets. You know, the idea of having you know a Rolex watch, a bar of gold, or something with a cryptographic seal on it, you know, you, you can do proof of possession. You know, I think that's another category, another category again, is that legal bridge is assuming that you're living somewhere where you have the rule of law and having title to a house, you know, is going to work. If you're in Somalia, it doesn't really matter. Possession's nine-tenths of the law at that point. But I think all three of those are are going to have roles to, to, to bring things on chain. Uh, 
uh, and really bringing them on chain is just getting them in a malleable form, right? Where they're on the computers and you can do stuff faster. Yeah. So I sort of understand the vision. I personally have, I have concerns about the stability of the bridge coin, but we won't go into it because you mentioned that you personally are not in the economic side of it, but actually in the building no. infrastructure side of it. Yeah. So the people to talk to there are, are, are Michael Zargab, uh, sorry, Zargam, uh, and uh, Alex Balkan at CoinFund, uh, and, okay. and Scott Nelson and, uh, and David Henderson, the, the CFO. They've done a lot of thinking. It's just not in my head. Okay, okay. But I do get the value proposition of, of, this, of this approach. So the value proposition uh, to me is is very clear because last year I I invested in a startup in India. The problem that this startup solves, like uh, wants to solve, is essentially the problem of uh, supply chain liquidity, right? So what they what they're doing is they're working in the construction industry. So uh, so in a construction industry, like imagine like I'm I'm a builder, right? I have to build this whole building. Right, and then I have customers to which I will sell like flats in this building, but in actually in order to build this building, I need like cement, I need like steel, I need all of these raw materials. So generally, what ends up happening is uh, the builder gets these raw materials and then promises to pay sixty days later. That same thing. Now that creates a lot of strain on the company that is making the cement, right? Like it has shipped all the cement out, but it's not going to get this money anytime soon. So the interesting bit here is, so the cement company essentially has these papers from builders that they will pay, that they'll pay them 60 days later. And they want to sell this paper and get actual money, actually dollars very quickly. It's the same Novartis problem, is the same as the builder problem in India, it's the same. But what is striking is, Novartis is usually able to sell these papers at a discount of 2%. So if Novartis is expecting $20 million out, they'll say, hey, we'll give you a discount of 3%, but take these papers and give us the money. But like that same cement company in India will need to offer a discount of 25% in order to get the papers off their hands. And that's the difference between a developed economy and a developing economy. So what this translates into is there's, ma there's many businesses that can work in a developed economy but will not work in a developing economy because that cost, the haircut you have to, uh, you have to admit is just so big. And the interesting bit about like, Sweetbridge and these approaches is we are potentially bringing a global pool of liquidity to bear on this problem. So no matter where that person is from, here's this global system that is going to bring this liquidity um, to, to any company that has this particular problem. So maybe ultimately it's going to make this kind of financing cheaper for all firms in the world rather than have this unequal distribution that companies in some countries have it easier and in others they don't. Absolutely. I mean, I, and, and that, that was something that, that hugely appealed to me is, is really, you know, it's, it's about level playing field is, uh, you know, the, the existing world economic system, uh, you know, it, it's effectively economic colonialism, you know, continued um, that there is, you know, this, this systemic economic, um, uh, you know, su suppression which means you, you just can't get out of it. You know, you, you're carrying a giant load on your back. Um, and, and, it just, and it just negatively impacts the whole of humanity. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know we, it, it's quite obscene with, the, you know, with all of the um, affluence and, uh, and, and resourcing that there is in the world, you know, that, that people are, you know, living in fear, uh, you know, that, that you have, you know, starvation, homelessness, lack of access to, uh, you know, to education um, and, and healthcare. When, you know, we, we, we're living in a world of abundance. It's just incredibly uh, poorly distributed. Um, 
uh, and really that's by design, obviously. So let's not do that. We, we really have an opportunity, I think, with 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 blockchain to to build a, a, a fairer and better system for everyone. So let's move on to. Um... So we we've spent quite a bit of time spending on the, on the liquidity aspect of uh, of Sweetbridge, uh, but there are other components to this uh, to this protocol. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the liquidity um, part of the protocol is is the perhaps the most important. But let's spend a little bit of time on the other components. Can you uh, describe very briefly sort of the other layers and what role they play? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I guess the, 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 the big thing to say about Sweetbridge as a whole is uh, that Sweetbridge itself is not looking to build any products. It's, it's looking to build uh, protocols um, and uh, alliances, and ecosystems for all sorts of things to arise on top. Um, the, you know, the background of most of the founders of uh, of Sweetbridge is deep, deep experience in in supply chains, financing, settlement. Um, you know, basically f- facilitating the process of giant amounts of uh, of contracts and invoices for for for, for major supply chains. Um, and you know, something that, that that Scott Nelson was saying, the CEO, was that uh, you know he's been doing smart contracts for ten years. Uh, but you know, without blockchains, it was it was really automation of, of of contracts, you know, digitization of contracts and and, and verification that uh, you know these contract terms are being met and people are being paid and uh, and the thing is being settled out. So um, while you know the majority of the focus is is on this liquidity piece, <coughs> it's really because you need that. To get to the next bits, which are uh, uh, you know the, the really the wheelhouse uh, of the principles uh, of, of, of you know, the founders of, uh, of Sweetbridge, which is really these these, these settlement and, uh, and supply chain pieces. But you need that stable, you know, base to be able to get to those. Um, so, really, the, the the next layer there is 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 settlement. Yeah. Um, which is really well. If you have that economic basis, what you can have is you can have a series of companies which are basically a- agreeing to, uh, you know, to interact with each other um, in in Bridgecoin. You know that they are all living in that uh, overlay world economy of uh, of, of a more liquid um, but stable uh, currency where you, you you can make contracts with each other. Uh, on that basis, so um, the alliance, the Sweetbridge Alliance, uh, is a a group of partner companies within this sort of growing ecosystem who are basically looking to dog food and and live within this this new paradigm. And starting with the liquidity protocol, but but building up from there. So yeah, the the the, the second layer protocol. Though, though really the idea of layers implies that you know you have a, a single linear set of stages you're going through, which is also not the case. Um, you know, Sweetbridge are, are encouraging others to build on top, but you know, build your own layers. Um, you know, there's no there's no magic answer here. Uh, the the web of world trade is probably one of the most complex systems there is, and really you're talking about you know, business process automation, and and it's going to be a very heterogeneous setup um, so uh, and, and that really starts to manifest in terms of blockchain technology at that settlement layer in that liquidity as we have it right now is ethereum mainnet but when you get up to that settlement layer and you start getting to actual um, supply chain technologies you know that's where we start working uh, with fabric fabric composer probably Corda, and probably any other uh, other blockchain tech that that uh, that needs to to get plugged in and also non-blockchain ones as well you know there will be SaaS uh, legacy things which are going to have value from connecting into liquidity or connecting into settlement where settlement is really 
saying, well, hey, here is a here is a, a web of of these contracts which have been agreed. Uh, who's going to pay who and when does that happen and how does that happen? You know, that that um, is both a mixture of something that you can have on a per smart contract basis. But some of those are perhaps, you know, outside of that. You know, if you if you have this this um, this web of suppliers. Um, well, who gets paid first? If if somebody has not paid their suppliers and they have some money coming in, well, does it go to them, or does it go round them? You know, where where, where does that happen? But uh, you know that that is a common problem as well in supply chains is that uh, you get dragged down by your partners. You know, you have a situation where uh, somebody owes you for something and they haven't paid it yet. Are you going to stop supplying them? if you stop supplying them that might kill them even more and that might mean you never get the money you know so this is a very common problem is 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 your business partners end up having problems and they drag down you know their their others with them um, hmm. but that's something again where you model the thing as as a network uh, on you know with more you know more free market pieces you can you can probably start you know decoupling things Quite significantly, you're not necessarily having to do, you know, hey, you're my only supplier for this, and I'm going to sign a, you know, three-year exclusive deal with you. Well, no, like, I'm just going to get things from wherever, whoever can supply them. You know, you can end up with a lot more of a fluid kind of network, and and really, hopefully, isolate some of that damage a lot more. Where, okay, you're 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 going down. You know, you you haven't paid your suppliers. Well, maybe the money gets routed around you. You know, maybe the the network just routes routes around it, right? You've got an an internet route round the damage kind of uh, you know analogy going on in these financial networks as well. Hopefully, isolate the damage more than you know, has been the case traditionally, where you have got very very rigid, you know, painful uh, relationships. Cool. So. Um... The Sweetbridge project uh, is doing an ICO as well, right? Um, so tell us about the ICO and what is the token that is being offered for sale? Yeah, so the the, the crown sale that we have ongoing um, has been running since you know, December. It's going through going through different phases, different different tranches, and uh, what's being sold is is Sweetcoin. So the, the, there are there are two tokens in in the economic model. There is bridge coin, which is the stable coin. So really, there's multiple bridge coins. You know, you can have bridge coin US US dollars, bridge coin euro, and so on. Um, and the second uh, token is is sweet coin, which is a uh, a discount token model. Now, a discount token model is really very very interesting. Um, and and a little different to a utility token in that the the economics of a discount model are really really aligning um uh incentives in that the value that you have from a discount token is using it you know if you use these discount tokens well you get discounts um if you don't use them then you don't you know so hodling gift cards is a bit stupid you know, um, you can, but really, you're not well served to do that. So, both the quite heavy sort of KYC manual KYC process we have, together with that discount token model, discount token model, have really made Sweetbridge really quite different to an awful lot of the other projects out there. In that, we are really quite repellent to speculators which is great because that's not what we're looking for you know we're not we're not about self enrichment we're about building a better world and building a better economic model and really the people that we're looking for um to buy sweetcoin are people who want to use sweetcoin who want to uh you know use use that uh, liquidity model um or do their own, you know, crowdfunding. That's another thing that we have is that the uh, is that the platform that we've built 
you know, is being offered again as a sort of, you know, crowd sale in a box kind of solution to, uh, you know, to companies on, on, in in the Sweetbridge Alliance or or who want to join that, who uh, who see value in that in that discount token model, uh, which is really on the basis it's on a it's on a so Scott was telling me it's a the the valuation is on a on a five year sort of basis that you you know using your discounts over over that term should be a should be sort of a wash. Um, so yeah, really the model is that uh, you know anyone can use the protocols you know at a low interest rate that will depend on the asset class don't have exact numbers it's going to vary by country as well but then you can apply these tokens to reduce your rates all the way down to zero you know so you can have interest free uh, lending the other thing there as well is that we are looking to set up our own fiat gateways uh so you could also get uh you know fee free fiat exchange if you do want to exit it. Okay, cool. So with regards to um, how you'll be launching this, so how will people be able to um, use uh, this platform at the beginning? So what is sort of your go-to-market strategy? How will you launch? Yeah, so the, the, the initial product, uh, which was slated for, for Q1, but there's only two weeks left, so maybe that isn't happening. Um, was uh, well, or is uh, that we will have a, a mobile app, uh, which is your, you know, your 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 wallet, um, and that you can uh, deposit Bitcoin and Ether uh, in that, and that you can uh, that you can lend against those that you can that you can mint Bridgecoin. Uh, that is the uh, that's the initial uh, uh, MVP. Um, the the sweet coin has been minted. That happened in in January. Um, some people who were in the earlier rounds of the sale, you know, have requested that that be uh, you know sent to their own wallets. You know, they want to keep it on a ledger or what have you. Um, they are both um, sweet coin and bridge coin are EIC twenty uh, compatible tokens, so you can do that if you want. Um, but the thing is that moving it outside in that way has basically un-KYC'd it. It's, you know, it's taken it out. So, you know, those those tokens as they are are pretty, you know, kind of pretty worthless in that secondary state. You know, we are not looking to go to exchanges. We're not looking to list. I guess, the you know, there's a risk that you could have a rogue exchange um, just choosing to do that anyway. But those those un KYC tokens they can't be used uh, for their purpose. You know you can't use the discount token unless you're inside the system. So really, again, that's another repel speculators kind of uh, approach. Uh, you know you could sell or gift those tokens to somebody who uh, who would go through that process again. You know who had been KYC'd and could show hey. I have acquired more tokens. Can I, you know, get these blessed back in? Um, but you know, that's a that's you know again a slow manual process. So really, the aim is is to build, um, you know, a, a a closed ecosystem. Though that's closed um, to people within, you know, within that alliance within the customer base. You know, not to you know, it's not a company silo. It's a project silo, a, a community silo, um, and that really those where you do have bridges to fiat, that that will be done by creation of new uh, of, of legal entities uh, to do that in a you know in a regulatory compliant way. So really, not looking to have any speculative elements in any of this. Well, that that would really be a, a novel approach to to um, to launching a coin, I'd say, uh, if if you'd managed to pull that off. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, uh, Bob. It was uh, great to talk about uh, about Street Bridge, and looking forward to seeing how this how this vision gets rolled out. I mean, because it is quite a grand vision, 
Oh um, yeah. As uh, as our listeners will probably have uh, have understood after um, after this interview. So uh, thank you so much, and and we look forward to seeing how Sweet Bridge will uh, will evolve. No, no worries, and and I would thoroughly recommend that everyone have a look at the, the there is a, a fantastic video of of scott nelson and vinay gupta chewing through all of this stuff it's it's an hour and 40 minutes long it's an absolute epic you know head-to-head meeting of the minds uh really talking through an awful lot of uh, of, of this um, yeah i i watched that i mean i watched part of it earlier because it is quite long but as i said you you guys put out these uh these sort of thought videos out them that sort of talks i guess which are uh, you know very interesting where where you go in depth into some of all some of these issues with sort of the economics uh but also the technical aspects so we'll link to those in the show notes yeah i mean tons of videos tons of blog posts uh and and yeah lots of depth i mean another thing that really appealed to me in the first place is that some of the very first public releases from sweetbridge were a series of blog posts on core values and core beliefs you know that really this is a you know a really deeply ethical you know big vision thing um and that was really very unique to me and i resist great well thanks again and thank you to our listeners for once again tuning in we release new episodes of Epper center every week you can subscribe to the show on itunes soundcloud your favorite podcast app on ios or android and you can also watch the video version of the show on YouTube. Uh, if you're interested in getting in touch with us, uh, you can do so now on our Gitter channel, which is epicenter.tv slash Gitter, where um, you can speak to us or other members of the community. And you can also support the show by leaving an iTunes review. It always helps uh, more listeners find the show. And we're also very glad to see your reviews. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.